Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Molecular Cell Biology YouTube channel. Today I want to address one specific idea that is critical to understand how the cell works. And that is, how is it possible for the DNA that is present in every cell in your body to be packed in a little tiny nucleus, in the little tiny nucleus of the cell? And to give you a sense of the proportion of this question, keep in mind that the total amount of DNA that you have present in every cell in your body in length is about six feet. That is, about this distance. This is the length of the total amount of DNA that you have in every cell in your body. So you have to fit this much DNA. And what I'm referring is, this is what you will get if you were to open up every chromosome that you have in the cell. If you were to use micro nano tweezers, in fact, and you were to actually open up every chromosome that you have in your body, like the 23 pairs of chromosomes that you have in every cell, if you were to open them up, all the way so that they will be as long as they can be, the length that those expanded molecules of DNA will occupy will be exactly this much. This is how much distance those 23 pairs of chromosomes, those 46 chromosomes, will actually span. This will be it. So how do you put all of that in a tiny nucleus in the cell? Remember that the nucleus, in average, has a diameter of about 10 micrometers. That's the diameter of the typical nucleus of a mammalian cell. So how do you fit six feet of DNA into a tiny nucleus that is 10 micrometers in diameter? That's the essential question that I want to address briefly. Now, we are not going to go into the ultimate complexities of this question. The only thing that we are going to address is the original essential structure that is used to pack DNA within the cell, and that is the nucleosome. So that's really the concept that we're going to be dealing with, the nucleosomes. That is the essential structural unit that is used to package DNA within the cell. So the question of how do you pack all of that is because DNA is wrapped in the form of nucleosomes. So what is a nucleosome? A nucleosome is what you get when you have your double-stranded molecule of DNA, and it's going to be represented by this line that I'm drawing here, and you wrap that double-stranded DNA molecule around forming these structures. And what, I, what I'm making is 1.6 turns, and each one of those 1.6 turns is about the amount of, the number of times the DNA is wrapped around in those structures that we refer to as nucleosomes. So this is the way that you pack DNA within the cell. You wrap around the DNA around a set of proteins that allow for the organized wrapping of DNA. So that then you can fit all of that DNA in the tiny volume of the nucleus of a cell. So that's your DNA. Let's actually write that down so that we can actually keep track of what we are doing here. That's the DNA. And that's the way that the DNA gets wrapped in the cell. Now, what's in the middle of those structures? In the middle, right here, you have proteins. In fact, you have four different proteins, each one of, the, of them present as a two copies. Those proteins that are present right there are the histones. And there are four different histones that are present in those structures. You have histone H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, forming the core of each one of those nucleosomes. So a nucleosome is a structure that you get when you wrap DNA around the histones. Now, if you were to cut in between here and here, and you were to open up that structure, so let's actually make another color here. If you were to take that section and you were to open it up, the length that you will get, the length of DNA that you will get when you open it up, so it's wrap around the histones, but now you're extending it and making a linear molecule of DNA out of that, the length that that will actually cover is about 200 base pairs. That's how much that will actually be if you were to open it up, 200 base pairs. 
So the nucleosome is about 200 base pairs of DNA that wrap around the four core histones. Now, each one of these nucleosomes is actually further stabilized by another histone. So we need to add another protein here that is going to be kind of like interacting on top of those nucleosomes. That additional molecule, which is another histone, is histone H1. And it further stabilizes the structure of the nucleosome. So histone H1 confers more stability to the structure of the nucleosome. All right, so the question is, this is what we know in terms of the structural unit that is used to pack DNA in the nucleus. But how did we get to that knowledge? How did we get to know that this is the way that DNA is packed within the cell, that it is packed in the form of nucleosomes? How did we get to determine the nature of these structures that are our structural units of DNA packaging in the cell? Well, the answer is that was a model that was drawn based on data that was obtained by two different methods. One of them was electron microscopy, and the other method was micrococcal nuclease digestions, followed by agarose gels, so agarose gel analysis. All right, so let's, let's take a quick look at the data that allows to draw those models. First, the electron microscopy data. What people did back then when they were trying to establish the way in which DNA was organized within the, the nucleus was to simply take the content of everything that was present in the nucleus and spread it out on top of a little slide for an electron microscopy and then just basically capture an image directly of the way that the DNA looked when it was spread that way. And the image that they obtained was exactly what is being shown here. So they obtained those images, in which what you have is those little structures that look like cotton candy, and they are all connected together by that, by that narrow little structure, which is your double-stranded DNA molecule. So it's almost as if you have DNA, a string, the DNA looks like a little strings, and then it's connecting little balls that are kind of like on top of that connecting DNA. That's, that's what they obtain, that's what they observe. Now, the little balls, they assume, was then going to represent DNA wrap around something. So the little balls represent DNA wrap around something. Later on, it was determined that that something that the DNA was wrapped around was the histone proteins. The other type of studies that were performed at the time to come out with the model of the nucleosome was micrococcal nuclease digestions. So let's, let's go now and talk about the micrococcal nuclease. So what is micrococcal nuclease? So micrococcal nuclease is a, as its name says, it's a nuclease, which means it's an enzyme that has the ability to chew up, digest nucleic acids. And it's called simply a nuclease because it can chew up both DNA and RNA. Now, the nucleases that are a little more specific, the ones that can only chew up DNA, are referred to as DNases. And the ones that can only chew up RNA are referred to as RNases. But micrococcal nuclease is a nuclease, mean, it, meaning it can actually chew up both different types of nucleic acids. It, it is active both on DNA as well as on RNA. That's why it's called a nuclease. And again, this is micrococcal nuclease. All right, now, micrococcal nuclease has another property that is quite interesting. And that is that if you have a nucleic acid, in this case, double-stranded DNA, micrococcal nuclease can chew up this molecule of DNA both from the ends, so it can actually do exactly this. It can chew up from the ends. Let's actually do it a little more effective. Let's make this bigger, okay? So it can chew up from the ends, but, it can also chew up this DNA molecule fr from within, meaning it doesn't need an end to be effective, it can actually cleave within the molecule of DNA. It can fragment that molecule of DNA inside. So it has both exonuclease activity, meaning it can chew up from the ends, but it also has endonuclease activity, so it can actually break it inside and therefore generate breaks within the molecule. 
Now, what is the condition for micrococcal nuclease to be able to do either of these activities? The condition, the thing that limits the activity of micrococcal nuclease is its ability to wrap around the molecule of DNA. So if this is DNA, and that DNA were to be wrapped around, so I'm going to represent now the DNA as a cylindrical structure. So if you take that molecule of DNA, oh, I didn't want that, and you wrap it around something else, and remember that something else that we're wrapping around DNA around is our histone proteins. If you wrap around the DNA against something else, now everything that is wrapped around is going to be in close contact with the histones. So another way to represent it would be now you have here the histones making close contacts with the DNA, and having the histones here making close contacts with the DNA will then prevent the micrococcal nuclease, which you can imagine it being kind of like a, a giant Pac-Man, molecular Pac-Man. Let's see, let's make this a little bigger so that then we can do this more effectively. There you go. Here we have this Pac-Man. But this Pac-Man will not be able to chew around the molecule of DNA if it is establishing those close interactions that I have indicated that it is establishing with the histones. It actually gets on the way. It prevents it from being able to interact right there, to get in there. So it cannot really get in there. The nuclease is trying to get around, but then when it tries to get around, it gets blocked by having the histones in there. And that prevents it from being able to cleave the DNA. So any region of the DNA that is in close interaction with the histones is going to be <laughs> is going to be protected from micrococcal nuclease attack. So with that in mind, it's easy to see that this Pac-Man molecule that we have here will only be able to chew up regions that are exposed, regions that are like totally exposed in the DNA. Anything that is in close interaction with the, with the histones will be protected. Things that are free will be easily cleaved. So let's go back to our previous model. When we have DNA in this close interaction with the histones, where we have histones, let's make this a little clearer. Let's put the histones in this figure so that it becomes a little more evident. The histones are here, and I'm going to make them be, occupy more space so that it becomes more evident, the kind of interactions that you have between the DNA and the histones. Just keep in mind that's 1.6 turns of DNA around the histones in every one of those areas. So if this is the way that you have it, then your, your little Pac-Man, the micrococcal nuclease, will only be able to cleave areas that are absolutely free of the histones, which means it'll be able to cleave here, it'll be able to cleave here, but it will not be able to cleave right here. It will be repelled because it's blocked by having those close interactions with the histones. So only when you have fairly accessible DNA will this micrococcal nuclease be able to chew up on your DNA. So when you add the micrococcal nuclease, the first regions that will be accessible will be the regions that are located right in between adjacent nucleosomes. So the more accessible areas where the DNA is fully exposed because it is not in close interaction with the histones. So those will be the first regions that will be targeted by the activity of the micrococcal nuclease. Now, with that in mind, once you do micrococcal digestion, what you're going to end up with is cleavage in between nucleosomes, which will then end up cutting everywhere, providing then for the length of DNA when it is drawn on an agarose gel to be indica indicative of the essential length of nucleosomes, that is 200 base pairs. Now, what is funny about this data, though, is the fact that you don't see just a single band on these agarose gels. And just a reminder, when you actually run nucleic acids on agarose gels, you're separating them based on their size. 
Typically, the samples are loaded on the top part of the, of the gel. So this is where you will be loading your DNA. And then the DNA will be put in an electrical current and you will have your positive electrode at the bottom, negative electrodes on top. So that then the DNA, which is negatively charged, will actually be migrating toward your positive electrode. So it'll be migrating through the gel and the smaller the DNA molecules are, the faster they will be able to migrate through the gel. So large fragments of DNA will be on the top, small fragments of DNA will be toward the bottom. It'll be a separation that is specifically dictated by the size of the DNA molecules that are being uh, pushed through the gel by the electrical force that is present. Okay, so with that in mind, the data that they obtain is what is shown here on the figure. So why is it that you have not just one single band, but many bands? Why do you have more than one band? Well, the first thing that we have to keep in mind is that there is a space in between those bands. There is a specific spacing that separates one band to the next. And the spacing between one band and the other band is exactly about a distance that will correspond to a length of about 200 base pairs. That's the distance between adjacent bands in this gel. So every 200 base pairs of length, you have about one band. Now, then the question is, why? How come that you have that spacing? Why is it that you don't get just a single band of about 200 base pairs, but instead you end up getting many bands that are separated by 200 base pairs? Now, the fact that they are separated by about 200 bases implies that the second band is about 400 base pairs in length, the third band is about 600, the next one will be about 800, and so forth. The higher you go this way, the longer the DNA molecules are. And the difference between consecutive DNA fragments that you see in these type of gels is about 200 base pairs. So then the question is why? Why not a single band, but multiple bands? What's going on in this system? Well, the answer to that is that there must be something that is keeping the microcochal nucleus from being able to cut in a specific locations. What is keeping microcochal nucleus from being able to cut in those regions? Because if, if that's happening, then the size of some of those fragments will be the addition of two consecutive nucleosomes. So if you can't cut here, if you're not allowed to cut right there, then the size of the fragment that will be produced when you cut here and here will be the sum of the length of this nucleosome plus the length of this nucleosome, which will be 200 base pairs here plus another 200 base pairs here, which will give you a fragment that will then be about 400 base pairs. And if you have further blockage in between more of these fragments, so for instance, now you are unable to cut here and here and even here. If you were to block three of those linker regions, and by the way, that's the name that we assign to those regions, we call that linker DNA. So if you have linker DNA being protected from microcochal nuclease in multiple consecutive nucleosomes, then you end up producing longer fragments of DNA. So in this case, we have one, two, and three nucleosomes that would not be chewed up by the activity of the microcochal nuclease. Actually, we have four here in this diagram, one, two, three, and four. That will be four times 200, so the length of that particular fragment will be 800 base pairs. So what could be protecting the linker DNA? The answer is you may actually have another type of proteins that are able to interact with DNA. And those proteins will be interacting in those regions, in the linker DNA. Those proteins are interacting with the DNA in a way that is less stable than the interactions that are established with the histones. So therefore, we, indic we indicate those interactions as being loosely associated proteins. They are loosely associated because they are grabbing the DNA, but they are not grabbing the DNA quite as tightly as the histones. 
because they are just interacting with the DNA kind of like sideways. The DNA is not wrapping around those proteins. So therefore, it's a loose association. It's an association that can happen, but over time may actually be lost. So those proteins that are interacting in those regions, they may actually fall off from the DNA over time. So they can be there, but then they can fall off. So when those proteins fall off, they open up space where micrococcal nuclease can now come in and cleave the DNA. And that's the reason why, as you expose your chromatin for a longer period of time to the activity of micrococcal nuclease, you end up obtaining the profile that is shown on this gel. So what this gel actually shows is a time course analysis of micrococcal nuclease digestion of chromatin. The first lane, the indicated by U, will then show the way that chromatin is either when it is not being digested by micrococcal nuclease or when you just added the micrococcal nuclease and you haven't given it any time to start cleaving on your DNA. So that's basically undigested chromatin. Then lane number one shows what happens upon a short time exposure to micrococcal nuclease. If you add the micrococcal nuclease and you allow it to digest, for a limited amount of time, then you get the profile shown in one, where the majority of the chromatin will still have a fairly large length because micrococcal nuclease have cleave only in very small places because you still have associations with those loosely associated proteins uh, remaining in most of the linker DNA. But the longer you allow for micrococcal nuclease digestion to take place, the smaller the size of the fragments produced becomes. So the longer you digest, the shorter the re resulting DNA fragments end up being. And that's because now you're allowing for time for those loosely associated proteins to fall off from the DNA. And once they fall off, the region that was protected before is now exposed for the micrococcal nuclease to come in and cleave in there. Then it can cut your DNA right there, it can chew it up, and the longer you expose the DNA to the micrococcal nuclease, the more the loosely associated proteins can actually fall off from the DNA. And therefore, the more cleavage you will obtain with micrococcal nuclease. One final thing that is important to mention, and that is that upon prolonged exposure to micrococcal nuclease, the fragments that you end up getting are even smaller. And the reason for that is the following. You have histone H1 here. You have the other histones in here. You have those close interactions with chromatin right there. So remember, there is DNA there. I'm just going to exaggerate this to make it more obvious. So I'm going to make the histones be even larger so that you get the sense that you have DNA in there. Don't, don't forget that you still have DNA wrap around the histones in there. But those interactions are very tight interactions because it's wrapped on top of the histones. So the initial place where micrococcal nuclease will be chewing on that DNA is on the linker DNA, which is the most successful region of the DNA. And that will be mostly right in the middle in between two adjacent nucleosomes. So if you have another nucleosome, Let's do that. Let's generate another nucleosome here. Let's actually put it where it needs to go. So that's where you will have the next nucleosome. So if you have two nucleosomes, just like that, micrococcal nuclease will have easy access to a region right in between the two nucleosomes. That's where digestion will actually take place initially. So the first place where you will have cutting is right there, right in the middle of the two nucleosomes. But once that has taken place. Now you have this. That central region is still protected, slightly protected because you have histone H1 here. So upon ex continued exposure to micrococcal nuclease, what is going to happen next is now micrococcal nuclease, since it also has exonuclease activity, it will also chew up on those ends and you will start chewing up further into the DNA. And you will get to a region that is actually partially protected by histone H1. 
And that's why the length of the nucleosome will go from having a length of about 200 base pairs to having a length of about 166 base pairs. And that structure, the one that is 166 base pairs, is what we refer to as the chromatosome. Now, if we continue to digest this structure even for a longer time, so if we continue to expose that to micrococal nuclease digestion, now what is going to happen is the histone H1 at some point will actually fall off because that interaction is not as stable as the interaction that is established with the histones. And now you have further exposure of the DNA so that your micrococal nuclease can continue to chew up on the DNA. So now the DNA will be chewed up even further, therefore making the length of the DNA that is protected even smaller. That's why upon even longer exposure to micrococal nuclease, then you end up with fragments of DNA that are about 147 base pairs in length. And that's what defines the nucleosomal core particle. So the nucleosome core particle is then what you have upon extended exposure to micrococal DNA digestion, to micrococal nuclease digestion. Um, so the length of DNA that, that is now produced is what is in truly close interaction with the histones. And that's why in the end, the final profile of the bands that you observe in, a, in an agarose gel upon micrococal nuclease tends to decrease in size, use so slightly, going from about 200 base pairs to a final length of 147 base pairs. In order to obtain further digestion of your DNA by the micrococal nuclease, you'll have to then eliminate the histones altogether. So you will stop at 147 unless you eliminate the histones. If you eliminate the histones, now the micrococal nuclease has full access to your DNA, and therefore the DNA will be degraded down to basically nothing. Very short segments of DNA, and eventually it will just be nucleotides. So that's what will happen with prolonged exposure to micrococal nuclease digestion. All right, well, I hope that this explains how we came out to formulate the model of the nucleosome, which again is the essential structure that explains how DNA is packaged in the cell. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope that you find it informative. And if you find this video informative, give it a thumbs up. And as always, remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel.